Well, Father God, again, just um, as we come before you and we open up your word, Lord, we recognize that this is your word. It's not just words on a page. It's certainly not words that I'm saying, Lord. This is what you have spoken for us. Lord, this is what you've provided for us, just to be able to to properly worship you, uh, to know who you are, Lord, to know what your will is and what's coming and how to understand, Lord, the things that are happening around us. You've given us so much instruction, um, and we just, we come before you this morning to receive that, uh, that we might be able to live for you, that we might be able to live rightly before you, and and in that, Lord, that um, in our lives, people would just see you at work and uh, that is the cry of our heart, and Lord, that, that's what we want to be. We just we want to be your servants. We want to be your representatives. We, we want to show this world who you truly are. So, um, Lord, we just, we just ask that you would equip us this morning with what you're speaking to us, and just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to wrap up chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians this morning, and we've got, like, this is a lot more verses than we would normally get through in a given week, but, but they all kind of hammer home to the same theme. So we're, we're going we're gonna to push a little bit, but on the same hand, there are some things we're really going to dive a little bit deeper in as well. Um, but again, our, our main theme as we go through this letter that Paul is writing to a young and quickly growing church in Corinth, our main theme has come out of Romans chapter 8, verse 6, which says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life. In peace. And, and we're going to see another example this morning. The whole front end of the book is just identifying the carnal, and the back end of the book is how to deal with it, which is simply in turning to the spirit. And we're going to see another microcosm of that this morning, just that progression from the carnal to the spirit. And that is the way the Lord will always be leading our lives, always. There's always going to be more carnality to, to call out. There's always going to be more of the spirit to be able to deal with it. So we will see even more of that this morning. But we're going to jump in in verse 17, and it says, Now, in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part, I believe it. So remember, just a couple of chapters, or just a, I think it was last week, a couple of verses ago, Paul offered praise for this church, you know, that for, for keeping to the practices that he had taught them while he was there. He had praise for them in, in just holding to the traditions, the, the, the order of worship that he had set in place there. And there were a couple of things that he had to sift out in that. But now he shifts gears pretty quickly, you know, <laughs> as you come together not for the better, but for the worse. And those would be humbling words to hear, especially as they're read in the setting of a fellowship. You know, you come together not for the better, but for the worse. You know, in essence, when, when we meet as a group of believers, there should be correction. There should be correction. And there should be encouragement amongst each other. There should be healing, because that, that's what our God does. And there should be conviction. And it should be, when we face that conviction, it should be something that we receive, not just bury our head and hide our face from. We should receive the conviction that the Lord brings to us. But more than anything, when we come together, there should be an unflinching focus on the one that we are here for. He should be central. He should be whole to why we meet. Jesus, you know, the thing about Jesus, he's not just a neat common hobby that we all happen to share. You know, he, he's not a quilting club. And we, and we can't treat them like that. As, as we read in Acts chapter 17, we've already seen this verse in this book. In Acts 17, verse 28, he is the one in whom we live. He's the one in whom we move. He is the one in whom we have our very being. So that being true, when we come together in his name, we share a commonality in our entirety. Now think about that. We share an entire commonality. We share a Lord in whom we live, each one of us, and in whom we move, and in whom we have our entire being. When we gather together, we should walk away from here better than we walked in. We should walk away in better shape than we came in, you know, specifically because we have together encountered the living God. And in that encounter alone, it should change who we are every time we meet. Romans chapter 14, verse 19 says, Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace. 
and the, the, and the things by which one may edify another. And Paul is saying here, very frankly, that is not what's happening when you all meet. You come together not for the better, but for the worse. When you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you. And in part, I believe it. So, so whatever divider that, that we would bring in with us, in this world right now, you don't have to look hard at all. This world is full of dividers. <laughs> this world is full of things that will try to separate, and it does a really good job of it. But, but watch yourself as you walk in these doors. Whatever divider we would try to bring in with us, whether it be political affiliation, whether it be social standing, whether it be non-essential doctrine, you know, whatever you might want to bring in with you, hear this this morning. Leave it at home. Leave it at home. Come here to meet with Jesus. Come here to worship Jesus. Come here to meet, expecting to meet with those who also live and move and have their being in him. And truly, let this be a place where everyone else who walks in these doors sees only him at work. That's why we gather. This, this world, this is not news to you. You know, this world is suffering. This world is suffering. And you have in your hands, you have the antidote. You have the solution. They should see that. This world is rife with division and faction and unrest and hardship. And if someone, when they come here, if they are on their last shred of hope, if they're, just, if they're looking for something real and they come through these doors, Whatever it is that they're coming in from, whatever they are going through today, whatever battle they are in the middle of right now, and this is the day, you know, this is the morning they listen to God pulling on their heart. Get to church. I have something to say to you. See what it's all about. Come meet with me. And they walk through these doors and they see anything other, anything at all other than our Lord at work. If they hear anything at all other than our Lord at work, anything other than the love that you have for one another, woe to us in that. Woe to us in that. If they only see what divides, that is the thing that they're going to walk away with. And that won't save them. And don't bring in here anything that's not going to save those that do come in with you. <laughs> If they come in here, they must see the one who can save them. They must. You know, we have a plaque up here. This is under my Bible as I teach, but we have a plaque up here on the pulpit. It's, it's, a, it's John 12, 21, the latter half of it. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. We wish to see Jesus. It is whoever ever stands up here sees that plaque first. And that is, that is what you should expect to see when you walk in. They should expect to see the one who died for them. They should see the one who rose again for them. I mean, take that as your mandate when you come here. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Your mandate this morning that Jesus would be seen through you by anybody who would come in here. It is a righteous privilege for anybody who stands at this pulpit, but it is your righteous privilege as well. Do they see Jesus in what you have to bring here? <laughs> because he alone, he alone has the words of life. And if we can't give them him, we are failing in our call. We have to give them Jesus, whoever walks through ever. <laughs> in verse 19, it says, For there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. And this, this gets a little complicated here, you know, because to a certain extent, this is a hard thing, to a certain extent, some division is unavoidable, you know, especially when there are those who don't want to follow Jesus. When there, there are those who don't want to obey his word or proclaim his word, some division in that is unavoidable. And Paul is saying there are divisions, and in part, I believe it. Remember earlier in this letter what we saw, there were many who were breaking off after this teacher or that teacher. And it's not at all a bad thing to follow different teachers, but what they teach must be of the word. And in, in the city that this letter was delivered into, there wasn't necessarily a central gathering place for the church. They were spread all over the place. In some groups and all that, they were beginning to press into different agendas and different teachings, things that were not of the Word of God. And, and we see that a whole lot today. We see that a whole lot today. A lot of people claim the name of Jesus Christ, but they want to live something else. They want to pursue something else as the focus. 
They want to follow something else or someone else and pull Jesus' name almost as a cover over whatever it is that they're doing. And you have to be able to identify it when it happens because it takes on a whole lot of different forms. And Paul here, he lays down an important principle, very important principle. You know, we, we pursue unity. We're, we're going to be teaching highly on unity in the coming chapter. We pursue unity as a body of believers. But when we pursue that unity, we never do so at the expense of purity. You cannot pursue unity if purity is not in the mix when it comes to the things of Jesus Christ. You never pursue unity at the expense of Jesus ceasing to be the focus. You never set the, the sight to the standard lower. You never at the expense of his word being neglected or watered down or compromised. And so if there is someone or if there is a group wandering off into the deep end, you know, want, wanting to flat out follow after false teaching or, or wanting to zero in and focus on a non-essential thing or flat out something extra biblical, not even of scripture, don't follow them. There's no call for unity in that. You don't have to stick around in the name of unity for things that are not of Jesus Christ. The word here for must, there must also, the word here for must is dideon. It is literally, literally necessary, is the word, necessary. And sometimes a division, literally a disunity, sometimes that is necessary, specifically when the word of God is compromised, that those who are approved may be recognized. You know, essentially, it's okay, you know, it, it's okay to say, you know what, <laughs> they're treading on some shaky, shaky ground scripturally. So it's okay to be able to say, I stand on God's word and God's word alone. And if somebody wants to stand on anything else, let them stand, but let them know you're not standing on what's true. You're not standing on what will last. It is okay to draw a line there. In the, in the midst of a world that is full of fuzzy doctrine and, and false teaching and outright heresy, it, heresy, it's okay to separate into what is true. So that people may know who is approved by God in what they say. And who is approved by God is simply those who will speak what God says. That's all. <laughs> the word here means properly acceptable, approved. It means properly acceptable or tried and tested. So that those may be recognized. Specifically that they may be made apparent. Very simply so that people will know who to listen to. There's got to be a line drawn when it comes to the Word of God. And anything not of the Word of God, it eventually fizzles out. It can be really popular for a period of time. It can gain your attention. It can capture your passion. It can capture a whole lot of your focus and your effort. But it's not the Word of God. And in that truth alone, it will fizzle out eventually. It always does. It comes back, it comes back in cycles. You, you, you be a part of the church long enough, you see these things. They, the, the, same, the same idea comes back. It has different names, different, different labels that they put on it, but it's the same concepts floating in and out of the church over the, the many years. But God's word always, God's word stands. And those who would simply adhere to that, they will be made apparent. They will be approved. They will be held up. And they will be sustained through the muddle. Those who earnestly seek God's word, you know, even in the event that they get lost in the muddle for a season, even in the event that they lose their focus for a season, if they are earnestly seeking God's word, he will bring them back if they earnestly keep seeking him. So you just hold to what's true. Eventually what's true will stand alone. Eventually what's true will be made apparent. For there must also be factions in that sense. You know, that, that should happen. It's okay to draw a line when it comes to God's word. But what was happening in Corinth was not that, <laughs> in what Paul is saying here. It wasn't that type of division. They were dividing arbitrarily. And they were dividing over petty reasons and selfish reasons and fleshly reasons. They were wanting to stay within a particular social class, almost like a, like a popularity contest when they came to meet. Or, or even, even baser still, they were unable to get past, past wrongs incurred by themselves, you know, or, or wrongs that had been inflicted on them from other brothers and sisters. They were unable to leave those things behind and began to create factions as they gathered together, and that was flat out not okay. The thing about coming together as a body of believers, gathering for a church service like this, particularly to take communion, what you have to understand is you are partaking of that representation of the body of Jesus Christ. That body that was broken on your behalf, 
You know, because he is what holds us together collectively. He is the one in whom we breathe and move and have our being. He's what hold us to, holds us together collectively. He's also what holds us together individually. He holds our lives together even as everything else seems to be falling apart. He's the glue that holds everything together. When you partake of his body in memory of what he had done, but then you try and break his body that we see before us apart, in the reality of the gathering, when you try and create division within his body, as you gather, you negate what his body was given for. His body was given specifically for healing and for mercy and for grace and for unity. <laughs> his body was given to draw to himself one church, one church, one body of believers to save us, to, to save anyone who would come to him and escape the fires of hell. And they had lost sight of that as they gathered. They had lost sight of the main purpose, the main reason for gathering. And in verse 20 here, it says, Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. It's basically saying, you may call it the Lord's Supper, but it is not that. It is not that. You may be gathering in his name, but you are not gathering in his heart. <laughs> and that should be a check to each one of us should be a check on how we live our lives. You know, is Jesus just a label to us? Is he just a label? Or is he the pattern of life for us? Is he our breath? Is he our life? Is he our very being? Or is he just a name? Is he just a t-shirt that we wear? You know, do we come together to partake of him together? <laughs> or do we come together for any other reason? Any other reason at all? When we leave, you know, when we leave, do we all leave in a better state than we walked in? Are you ensuring that everybody around you is leaving in a better state than they walked in? You know, refreshed and refilled, rededicated on a regular basis. Not just that we ourselves leave in a better state, but does everyone else around us do as well? And do we even ask how somebody's doing? Do we, do we reach out way past our comfort zone and say, how, how is it going really and don't just tell me fine. You know, don't just tell me good. How is it actually going? Do we offer to pray with anyone while they're here? Do we take the time to pray with them? Do we ensure that they're leaving better than they walked in? God here is doing a tremendous work in this fellowship. If you're a member of the prayer chain, you see it happening. There are unbelievable things happening. The things that we could not put together on our own. There are miracles that our Lord is performing here. He is doing a tremendous work right now. And so many among us are going through enormous things, life-changing things, life-destroying type of things. And, and so much of understanding what it is that God's actually doing here happens in the face-to-face -face interactions, in reaching out and asking, how is it actually going? You know, in all of this, are you reaching out to each other with Jesus' love and with God's grace? Because a great many of you are, and you are blessed as you see what God can do in these situations. It is beautiful to see it come together. And hey, if you sprint for the doors as soon as the service is over, you miss out. You miss out. Stick around for a couple of minutes and just see what he's doing in the other people here. You are called here to be together, to go through this life together, to point each other to Jesus Christ together. But what was happening here in Corinth, in verse 21, he says, for in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry, and another is drunk. What? <laughs> do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you, do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. So what they, what they were doing in Corinth, it, it had become some grotesque version of what it was supposed to be. They, they would get together to break bread together, to, to, to share a meal together. And at the close of the meal, they would partake of communion together. That was common. That was common practice in the early church, no matter where the church was. It was common to do exactly that. And it's something that we do here. You know, we, we get together on basically a semi-monthly basis. We have a meal together after church, and we partake of communion at the close of it. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. But in Corinth, as they gathered 
They were, they were getting into all sorts of excess. You know, there, there was a very, very wealthy among them. And they, they, they would bring in an abundance of, of delicacies. And I don't even know what good food would have been considered at that point. But then they would keep that food for themselves. This, this is the food for our table. You know, this is what we can eat. And they would have only select people around their table. And they would feed themselves first with that food rather than reaching out to those around them. You know, in all of that, you had city officials coming in, you had wealthy businessmen coming in, and, and they, were, they were at the same table, they were in the same room with bond servants and with tent makers and, and with your basic working class and with those who were struggling to find even their next meal. And some would come to these gatherings starving because they had nothing to eat at home, and they would leave still hungry. They would leave still hungry, and it was a tragedy. Having watched those around them eat to the full who had more than enough back at home to feed themselves. There were some, as we're going to see, there were some who were coming in full on drunk, you know, and just no interest, no discipline in curating space in their lives for God's presence to dwell. And they were bringing it in to the gathering of the church meeting among them. And Paul here, he, he's incredulous. He goes, what? <laughs> it's an exclamation point there. What? Do you despise the church of God? Do you shame those who have nothing? There is no praise in that. There's no praise in that. And, and practically, you know, I mean, we have a potluck here. We, we've never run into this particular issue. You know, somebody keeping their dish to themselves. We don't run into that. That's not an issue here, practically speaking. But this is something that translates and applies at a much, much deeper level. And something that should hit home with each one of us. Because it is. When we come here, you should ask the question, why are you here? Why do you come? Why do you come? Is it just to be fed spiritually? Is it just to be fed by what God has for you to eat? Is it just to satisfy your spiritual needs? And listen, that's a good reason to come. You should come and be fed. But the question is, are you here to be a part of Jesus' body? Are you here to feed yourself? Are you here to be a functioning piece of Jesus' body? To be fed? Yes, absolutely. But to reach out and feed others as well in your time here. Others who may be walking in the door starving. Others who may not have the background and the upbringing that you've had. The, the, the heritage of good teaching and scripture that you've had. Are you leaving them starving in any way? who walks through these doors, who don't have the same means, who don't have the same background, who don't have the same experience and the, the length of walk in Jesus Christ yet, are they leaving starving while you come and are fed to the full? It's a hard question to face and a good question to ask. Are you coming to share the giftings that God has placed on your life specifically? Do you come to answer his callings on your life and to receive the gifting that he plans to use in that calling? Is that why you come? Is there anyone here who comes hungry for the things of God who leaves less than full, who leaves hungry because you personally are withholding, either refusing to answer God's call on your life or withholding in how he has gifted you? And there's not a single one of us here that can't just simply reach out and say, how are you doing? How can I pray for you today? Does anyone leave less than full? And what can you do about that? It is great. You know, it is necessary to come and be filled for each one of us. I've told you guys this before. I come. There's, there's teachings I come specifically to hear. I come to be taught. We should come and be filled, each one of us. But if that's all that it ever is to you, if all you come for is to be filled and to be fed, it's just a spectator event to you. You, yourself in that, are missing out on the fullness that God intends to fill you with, do you despise the church of God? Do you despise the church of God? Do you shame those who have nothing? And that's the question before us. Do you? Do you? There's so much joy. We already talked about this this morning. There's so much joy in being able to come alongside someone else and watch God work in their lives. There's so much joy in knowing that he used you even for a fraction of a moment to help them in the situation that they are in. There's so much joy in getting to see God do something unbelievable, knowing 
that it, and whatever it is, it could have only happened by God's hand. There's tremendous joy in that, and you miss out. You miss out when your church experience, when your walk with Jesus is simply to come and eat, to come and be fed. He has such big plans for you, specifically and individually, bigger plans than the ones that you have for yourself. So many things that he intends to do if you would just let him. And listen to all this. Don't, don't be condemned in this. Most commonly, the hesitation is not a lack of desire to answer the call. Never. It's, nobody's ever said, I don't want to do that. Most often, most frequently, it's not defiance at all. It's more commonly a fear of not being qualified. It's a fear of not being prepared. It's, a, it's an overall feeling of not feeling worthy to do what God has called you to do. Much more often, it's simply, I can't do that. I don't think I can do that. <laughs> and in that, listen, there's not a single one of us ever who does anything for God that is qualified for anything that God has called us to do. The one who says, I don't think I can, that's the exact one who should. And that's, that's the alarm bell for me, the one who says, I don't think I can. And I say, good, do it, because <laughs> God will have to do it. That's the one who realizes exactly who they are before the Lord. That's the one who realizes they will have to depend on God for everything that happens through that work he calls them to. They realize that whatever good comes of it, it will be of God. A phrase I've become very fond of, this is not my phrase, I don't know who said it, but it's a good one. They, they, they said simply, God's callings are his enablings. God's callings are his enablings. Simply answering his call on your life. You know, I will go and do what he asks and go where he leads in my life. He will provide the ability. When you just answer the call, he will provide the ability. He will provide the wherewithal. He will provide the peace. And he will provide the strength. But even more than that, it is he who will accomplish the work. And you'll be amazed when he does. You'll think, how in the world did that just happen? You'll be left repeatedly and frequently thinking, I don't know what just happened, but God did it. The first step always is the hardest one. The first step always is the hardest one. But you take that first step, God carries you the rest of the way. He will carry you the rest of the way. Just don't turn back. Don't give up. Don't just be fed. How is he moving on your heart to use your life so that there are those here who would not leave less than full. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, don't be surprised when he starts to use all of it. Because he will. If you would just let him. He will use the entirety. But in verse 23, it says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now again, as these words were written, as Paul is sitting to, to, to have this letter written out, none of the four Gospels at this point, none of the four Gospels are in circulation yet. I think the earliest one is still a decade away at this point. So as we read this, understand this was not a complimentary text being offered at the time. Okay? It was not an appendix to what was already available. In the whole record of Scripture, this is actually the first recorded text of this idea of communion, of this, the idea of the Lord's Supper. You know, each gospel, of course, every single one of them, all four, they would provide eventually an account of that particular night. Matthew was there. He, he was there receiving communion, you know, he, as one of the 12 disciples. John was there as one of the 12 disciples. It is very possible that John Mark was there in some respect as a younger, younger man, maybe even a teenager. He was almost certainly there in the Garden of Gethsemane as, as Jesus was arrested. There's a very curious verse in Mark, you know, right as, right as everyone forsakes and flees Jesus at the moment of his arrest. Mark 14, verse 51, talks about a certain young man who had followed Jesus and basically had his tunic pulled from him as he fled, as Jesus was being arrested, and he fled from the garden naked. And just this anonymous young man, and it is a detail that goes unmentioned in any of the other gospel accounts. And many believe that that was John Mark's way of saying, hey, that was me. 
I was there, and I fled my Lord. I forsook him with everyone else. I fled naked. <laughs> it was possible that he was there. Luke was not there. <laughs> but he talked at great length with many who were, including certainly Peter. But in all that, Paul wasn't there either, right? Paul was not there as Jesus first gave communion, but he received this concept. What he's saying here, I received from the Lord. He received this concept directly from the Lord. And certainly he talked with the others who were there along the way too, but he is saying, I received this directly from Jesus. I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. So think about this. Think about our Lord in this moment. You know, rather than getting all riled up as, he's, as he is being betrayed in this moment, rather than getting all riled up about the betrayal, all fired up about the injustice that he was facing, rather than trying to plot a way out or extend his life even a couple of days longer, trying to find a way through, our Lord took bread with his friends with those that had gathered to him specifically. Our Lord took bread and he gave thanks as everything was happening outside of him that would bring about his death the next day. He took bread and gave thanks and he broke it. And he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. He set in that moment, he set the example for what it is to live for him what it is to follow him, whatever it is that we face in life, no matter the betrayal, no matter the injustice playing out in front of us or around us, no matter what heartache we're facing, no matter what distress we're facing, no matter what we have lost, we take his broken body. We give thanks. I think very often we fall short in that very piece, the giving thanks. We give thanks just to be able to share something that is life-giving. We give thanks. We give thanks for a God who is in control. Even when we can't understand anything that's happening around us, our God is in control, and we can give thanks for that. We give thanks for a God who is very much with us in those moments and will always be with us when we face those things. And we offer in all of that, we offer Jesus' broken body to anybody else who would receive him. Take, eat, his his body was broken for you. In all of that, you yourself will be broken at times. Now see our Lord in this. You yourself will be broken at times. You will be betrayed at times. You will feel at times as though you have given everything that you have to give, and, and there's nothing left. You know, And always in those moments, our Lord will be before you, sitting at this table, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You will come to the end of yourself in life. It will happen frequently if you're living it for him. You will come to the end of yourself. If you are serving Jesus in any capacity, this will happen often. <laughs> but there will always be more of him to give. There will always be more of him sitting at that table, reaching across, saying, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. There will always be more. There will always be more available for you and for everyone else around you. If you only give of yourself, you're going to run out, and it will happen quickly. But if you give of him, that supply is never going to run out. You can always give of him. And in verse 25, it says, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. So we partake of the bread. You know, we, talk, we, we partake of the representation of his body, and it, it acknowledges our responsibility in his death. By partaking of that body, we, we acknowledge that we're the ones who did that. We're the ones that he had to do that for, the ones that he came to do that for. We do this to keep central what has been done on our behalf. Not out of mourning, specifically out of gratitude, out of thanks, just sheer gratitude for what our God has done and provided for us. It is a repeated reminder that we have been made as one in his name. And for all of the difference, differences that we have, and we will have many, <laughs> all of the real and legitimate conflicts we may run into with each other, and we will have many, <laughs> all of the times that we may rub each other the wrong way, and we will have many, all the times that we say something careless 
or unthinking to each other, and there will be many. All the times that we may outright and flat out wrong each other, and there will be many, we are still united in him. We find our common ground only in him, and we partake to be a part of his body, absolutely. But the reason that he had us eat that cracker, the reason that he had us partake of his, that representation of his body is that his body becomes a part of us, too. It becomes a part of who we are when we partake, and that should be what our relationship with his church is. We partake, absolutely, but we partake to make it a part of us as well, one in him, him with us. We partake of the cup, the blood. You know, it acknowledges the incredible truth that our sins are forgiven in him. It acknowledges that there is power and that there is life and mercy and freedom in his blood. And we partake in the memory that it was poured out on our behalf specifically. And it says here, it is a sign of a new covenant, certainly that God will be merciful to us, that God will remember our sins no more. And the reason he has us drink is that the cleansing must happen inside where the heart is. It's not enough just to have the washing outside. We don't come and, and take communion by, by taking a bath, you know. He, he gives you what cleans and fixes and heals the inside, the heart. We drink of that. And in verse 26, it says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And this is an incredible statement, just the amount of poetry that our Lord built into it right here. We saw it written uh, somewhere this week. I saw it written in communion. You know, the Lord's Supper, it is the link between Jesus' two comings. On the front end, it's a, it's a monument to the, the first coming, his, his first advent. You proclaim the Lord's death, number one. <laughs> but it is also a pledge of his second coming. You proclaim it until he comes. Both comings built into one statement here. It is about more, as we partake of this together, it is about more than just the motion of the ritual. It is, it is a very important rite, communion. It is an important rite within the church. It is a touch point. It's a working object lesson of our faith whenever we do partake. But the thing is, is you can commune with Jesus Christ anytime. You can commune with Jesus Christ anytime. We should commune with him all the time. He should be a real presence in your life. And if he's not, ask him to be. He will. He should be a real presence, not just a frequent, a frequent guest at times. He should be a resident in our homes. He should be a resident in our hearts, a, a constant companion through whatever you face in life. In a cracker and a cup of juice will not do that for you. It can't do that for you. It is setting aside real time to be with him. And setting aside real time to hear from him and to love him and see this and all of this. Paul received this very thing, this ritual, this rite that we're about to partake of. He received this very thing from having that communion with Jesus Christ. He received it from Jesus Christ himself during just such a time, having set aside parts of his life, all of his life, to commune with our Lord. But we do, as we gather together, we do have these times where we set aside this rite where we partake physically as a memorial, you know, as a reminder of the promises to come, and truly as a chance to take a close look, really, at where we are. It's setting aside a time specifically to both come face to face with our sin, but more importantly, to come face to face with our Lord, our Lord who offered this for us, the one who provided the payment for that sin. And frankly, it's a moment to surrender again to Jesus exactly what he came to take care of in our lives. And so that's what we do. But in verse 27, it says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks, or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Ex examine yourself. Examine yourself. But in that, it's don't just use yourself as the standard. It's a mistake I think a great many of us make from time to time. Ask God to be your magnifying lens when you do this examination. Chuck Smith wrote, you know, it's not what you think about yourself that matters at all. It's what God thinks. So ask him, you know, ask him, what do you see in my life right now? He'll show you. He's probably showing you already. He will show you. He is faithful to show you what doesn't belong in his presence. 
And what's true is that you can't deal with an issue until you know it's there. You know, it's like, it's like dry rot under your house. You actually have to look to know it's there. You have to look. So ask, God, what's here that doesn't belong? What do you want to deal with in my life today? Ask him. He'll show you. And once you're aware of it, repent. Just repent. That's all it has to be. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's true. That's true, and that's available to you today, right now. Confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse from all unrighteousness. Confess your sin to God. <laughs> but it goes further in 1 John chapter 1, verse 10. It says that if we say that we have not sinned, if we, if we go into this right together thinking that we're just doing okay, <laughs> you know, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So as we partake this morning, ask him, Ask him and listen to his answer and then give it back to him. God, please forgive me. Have mercy on me in the name of your son. In verse 29, it says, For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So this, this idea of not discerning, the word here in the Greek, it is diakrino. It is separating thoroughly or withdrawing. So, so he who drinks in an unworthy manner does not attempt to separate the Lord's body from his own sin, from his own flesh. And, and this tracks to so much of what we saw in the preceding chapters. It speaks to tailoring a life of sin and license in your own life while trying to maintain a hold on Jesus Christ, essentially just for appearances. Don't do that rightfully partaking of his body, it is a thorough separating from your own flesh. It's a declaration that you belong to Jesus and no other. That you belong to Jesus no matter what else comes. Leave the sin behind. Leave the sin behind. Separate from it. Withdraw from it. Be cleaved unto him. There is a frequent, frequent misconception with this particular verse, specifically when it comes to communion. So please, this morning, hear this. Hear this. It's one I hear people voice very often. They will say, I just don't feel worthy enough to take communion. I don't feel worthy enough to take communion. I need to get things figured out first. I need to get my life straightened out. I need to get my life cleaned up. You know, maybe next time I'll get things right, and then next time I will partake. And I hear that frequently, frequently. It doesn't say here, he who is unworthy who eats and drinks. See that? It doesn't say he who is unworthy. It says he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner. Because what's true, and I hope you believe this because it is true, none of us are worthy of what's been provided for us. None of us are ever going to be worthy of what's been provided for us. This is simply saying, don't treat this lightly. Understand what's been provided for you. Understand the depth and the gravity of your sin and the beauty of the grace that's been extended to you to be free from that sin. Don't do this for appearances. And then go live whatever life you want to live the rest of the week. Don't do that. That's partaking in an unworthy manner. And to drink in an unworthy manner, the question here is not, have you stumbled lately? It's not, have you sinned lately? Every single one of us have. Every single one of us have. To drink in an unworthy manner is to not even take a moment's pause to see where you are today. To ask God, has anything crept in? Am I enter entertaining anything right now that, that shouldn't be there? Am I dwelling on anything that I need to be done with? <laughs> that I need to deal with today? Am I excusing anything in my life that has no business in your presence? Again, as we keep saying, it is a righteous privilege to be indwelt by the living God. The question for you to ask God this morning is, what am I bringing with me that has no business before you? And will you please take it from me? Anything that would stumble anyone else, anything that is eating away at my time, anything that is just flat out corrupting my life or my family's life or my ability to minister wherever God places me, not just when you're here, wherever. And when God reveals whatever it is, and he will, the prompt here is then, it's not, you know, the prompt here is not don't partake. The prompt here is simply repent, be his, and then partake. God, forgive me. 
forgive me of this sin, take this sin from me, take my life and do your will. And you can ask that of him even right now, this moment. But in verse 30, it says, For this reason many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. What's being said here is that, hey, there is a penalty for living falsely before Jesus Christ. There is a penalty for living hypocritically. And, and not at all in that. Not at all to suggest that if you're sick or if you're weak, that that is the problem. You know, sometimes we just get sick. We get hurt. We, we are weak. These bodies are dying. That is just true. You know, Paul is saying a number of you are partaking of the Lord's body in an unworthy manner. You're, you're devouring his people in the way that you live your life. You are boosting your own pride. You're harboring bitterness freely. You're, you're living with reckless disregard to those around you. And as a result, yeah, a lot of you are sick and weak and dying. Hypocrisy leads to just a great many going astray. The, the consequences are so far-reaching when it comes to hypocrisy. It turns a great many off to the things of God when they see it. And it can lead a great many into sickness, physically and spiritually. If so-and-so does this, I can do this. I'm going to go ahead and do this. You know, It can lead them into weakness. It can lead them even into death, again, physically and spiritually. In the immediate present, understand this, in the immediate present, you will do much greater harm to those around you than to yourself with your hypocrisy. The danger is greater to those around you. There's a great danger to yourself. The danger is greater at this moment to those around you. The heart through this whole letter is for the salvation and the edification and the provision for those that God has placed around you. So stop living for yourself. Stop living for yourself. That's why there are so many sick and weak and dying. To partake in a worthy manner. And I understand this, see this, hold this close. To partake in a worthy manner, it is simply to see clearly the one who has offered this for you. And to give him everything you've got. To give to him freely whatever he has given you. you know, to give him all of what he gave himself to cover. And you take this bread, you know, you take this cup, you must see our Lord. You can't do this without seeing our Lord being the one offering it to you. See him on the eve of his death as he was about to be beaten and torn. As he's about to have his beard pulled out of his face. face as he's about to be stripped of his clothing and, and nailed to a cross. And see him gasping for his every breath as he hung on that cross. See our Lord looking across his table at you this morning saying, he did this for you. And take, eat. He provided this for you out of his love for you. And we can thank him for that. This is my body that was broken for you. This is my blood poured out for you. As often as you partake, do this in remembrance of me. Do it in remembrance of who I am and do it in remembrance of what I came to do. He came to free you from yourself, from the sin that binds you. He came to pardon you from the death sentence that awaits you outside of him. And he came to give you eternal life, specifically with him. And do this in remembrance of him and give the sin over to him. Repent of it. Be free from it. Let him carry you forward. But in verse 33 and 34 here, it says, Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order when I come. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. Essentially, what we're about to do, this is no common meal here, what we're about to partake of. This is eternal life. This is eternal life that's been offered for you. This is amazing grace, literally. Wait for one another. This isn't like, you know, hang back in line and let everyone else go before you. It is so much deeper than that. The language here is more suggestive of simply tending to each other before ourselves. And just like we saw in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 24, let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. When you come, when you come to gather with his people, come expecting to pour into somebody else. Come that way. That should be the heart. 
whenever we come here. It should be the heart wherever we may be in life. So we are going to take communion this morning. If the worship team wants to come up, those serving would please come forward and start passing out the crackers, guys, if you wouldn't mind. We don't do closed communion here. <laughs> this is not like well, I'm, it's first, this is my first time ever at this church. I must not be able to partake of it. It's not that at all. If Jesus is your Lord, if, if this morning you plan to give your life to him, partake of this. This was offered specifically for you. This was offered specifically that you might have eternal life and forgiveness from sins. You know, it's, it's a good thing. We don't do closed communion here, but make sure he is your Lord. Make sure that this isn't just something you do visibly or visually for other people to see you do. Don't do this falsely, you know. It's, it's just a store-bought cracker and some juice, but what's represented here is eternal. What's represented here is eternal. It is the most important thing you will ever be presented with. And don't take time to go think about it later this week. If he's speaking to you this morning, don't, don't say, I'll do next time. I'll come back. If he's speaking to you this morning, answer him. Because the tragic truth is that none of us are guaranteed even the next five minutes. If this is your moment, take it. If this is your moment, receive him. What we see here, what we're about to partake of together, this is guaranteed. And if he's calling on you this morning, give your life to him, partake. Father, um, we come together this morning just recognizing what your son has done and what you have provided on our behalf, Lord. And um, The thing is, you know each one here. You know intimately what's going on in each life. You know where each heart is right now, Lord. And just wherever any one of us are, whether it be having lived with you for a long time and just simple course corrections, simple surrenders here and there, and whether it be rededicating our lives this morning, having backslidden for a period of time, and this morning we've been found out way beyond where we thought we were, and you're just calling us back to you. And Lord, whether it be that we've never given our hearts to you before at all, and you are calling out those words, come receive forever <laughs> in Christ the King. And Lord, we just we, we ask that you would be meeting each one where they are, even right now. Lord, that you'd be drawing us into your presence and that for whatever you've drawn to the surface this morning, the sin that we've been harboring, the sin maybe we didn't even realize was there, but that you made us aware of it this morning, we, we just ask for your healing in it. We ask that you would help us to let go. We repent of these things. Lord, we ask for your forgiveness. We ask that we just be made right before you. Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit into our hearts. And for those here who maybe have never given their lives over to you, who you have called, Lord, that you just be moving on their hearts to cry out to you those simple words, Lord God, I am a sinner. I know that you came to pay for my sin. I know that you have forgiven me of my sin, and I accept you. I accept everything that you've done on my behalf. I want to live for you. I, just, I, want, I want you to be my king. And then for every moment forward, I would just live for you and what you give me to do, that you would use every breath left, Lord. So we just, we, we ask this morning that for wherever anybody is, that, that you would just be ministering directly to us, that we would just, Lord, um, that we would walk away from here better, and that you would just be moving on our hearts to reach out and, and share the truth of who you are. But Lord, we just, we thank you, and we partake with gratitude. We thank you for what you've done and for what you've offered, and just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.